Hey you guys, how is everybody doing? I am Joe and let's have a look at table saws. Today I would like to go over 60 different ways plus that you can turn a table saw into a lot faster, a lot better, and a lot more accurate machine. Let's have a look, let's get started. Okay, I think I'm going to mention the first mod I did was taking the table saw and getting it up off the ground three and a half more inches. Now, you would normally see 2x4s going around the bottom of that saw, but that's why I cased it in walnut. So, my first mod was just getting the saw at the height I needed it, so that when I did these tables next, everything was at the height I already needed, and the saw was already leveled and ready to go. For number two, let's talk about what you don't or do have at the back of your saw here. I have taken out the splitter and I have taken out the overhead guard because I've made my own. So you need to have on your saw whatever works well for you and we'll go from there. For number three, I've added this, <clears throat> this hold down that's got ten wheels underneath that hold down on either side of the blade tightly and they're spring-loaded so they will make sure you don't have any chatter going on and uh, I've had it for a lot of years and it's done really well we also have a blast gate up here so the first thing you do put your wood underneath your thickness that you're going to use lower down your chute give her a gentle snug and you're done. Bring your blade up, you're ready to go. Open up your blast gate. It's a very clean way to cut and I will show you that in just a second. Okay, so next let's do a little movie on how well it works. Let's turn on the dust collector. <laughs> Notice the blade is holding tightly to the piece and you heard it in there. So this isn't going to come cranking out and hit you because it's being held down by rollers. Which is kind of nice because it leaves a nice clean cut and doesn't have the step in the end of the piece being cut off. It's a nice little unit. For number four, your fence lock. Some of these operate a little smoother than others. I don't know what that's all about, but what I decided I would do is I would polish mine. And it's about these ramp angles here, that these are both really smooth. And then that, that front of that washer is nice too, that that stuff isn't all galled. And when you put your fence and then, just one finger operation is extremely smooth. And for number five, I like a long fence. It helps a lot with a warped piece of wood. I can also clamp a piece of wood here and use it as a helper to have wood going in and out so things work nicer, get a smoother cut. You can also use a second fence to help your first fence if this is put in there properly. And lastly, you can move this fence all the way to the other end of your tables and clamp it so that you have an extremely rigid way of cutting whatever you're doing. And I use that first so I don't have to join pieces of wood. I can go right from table saw to a, a piece that's cut and ready to go without joining anything. Okay, for number six, I like a shorter fence when I need to do a whole bunch of cross cutting. Sure, you could do it on a miter box, but this is really a clean way to do it because I have downdraft. There's good vacuum here. So if you if you literally have a short fence or can shorten your fence to bring it all the way out, then when you're off the edge, you you could never have any binding once this comes to the end. If you're against a fence and that tips a little bit, it could be a bad day in there. So I like to not have a fence there when I come to the end. 
it's just kind of a nice way to do it. Another thing I'd like to add for number seven, if you have a big enough job that has enough sheets to warrant something like this, it's a great alternative to a lot more time by yourself. Um, it paid for itself just to do one very large job and I've used it many times since. And it's as simple as fire it up, get your saw going, and you can run a sheet of plywood or whatever through, piece of plastic, whatever you like, through and catch it on the other end, stack, get another piece going. Works pretty neat. And I would say number eight is going to be a eight foot fence. Now that's just over two meters and it's a great thing if you have the space. It's, it's a very special deal. You don't have the space, you just can't do it. I didn't even know these were available, but this is a great addition to any saw if you can do it. Number nine, let's talk about adding tables, whether it's a rear out feed table, side feed tables, out tables to the right of the blade, left of the blade, doesn't matter, just adding tables is such a help. You feel so much safer that the board isn't going to do something you don't want it to. So again, if you have the room, if you have the budget, if you have the time, putting some outfeed tables on a saw is paramount. So for number 10, let's talk a throat plate. I have four ways to level on top, four ways to level from the sides, one way to do it from the front so this keeps centered in the opening and then two screws on either side that keep it from splitting. Number 11 is an easy way to boost your vacuum and keep the mess off the floor. Just press a piece of closed cell foam in, take a zip tie backer, one of those sticky backers, put it onto your foam and just put a zip tie through and put another end on it for a handle. And that's it, you're done. You can just instantly pull it in or push it in and pull it out in no time and your vacuum's gonna improve and your floor will stay nice and clean. Okay, number 12 is sealing up the underside of the table saw. Maybe pieces of foam, duct tape, whatever you'd like to do to seal up all those areas with the cabinet and the top of the tabletop. It will boost your vacuum dramatically and it will have the mess be almost nothing when you're all done. Number 13 is notice the piece of PVC here. This is not stock. If you look inside, you can see I put a piece around there. And that's only because as I walked up to the table saw, it turned on because I had a lighter in my pocket. Okay, number 14 I have is rolling fence. And that's all I needed if you're literally running real giant stuff through. Uh, my miter gauge couldn't handle it anymore. I had to do something different. This was an old DeWalt unit. Uh, I'm sorry, an old Delta unit. And I put a new top on it. It was about half this size. And then I added a hinge down the middle to make the table double size. Okay, so number 15 is going to be a little tougher to explain, but this is an eighth inch pin. Although these are all a little bent and beat up from all the years of use. This is an eighth inch pin. This one gets smaller, and this one gets smaller yet. When you cut a piece of wood and the end piece is left here, Typically it's chattering on the edge of the blade here, teetering, making noise and wanting to be thrown at you. If you hold it here on this end, because it gets smaller at that end and bigger at this end, it unloads the pressure on the blade here. So instantly you can just touch this side and move it right past the blade without it touching that blade or making any problems whatsoever. Very safe game. These also keep this, as you're, as you're going through, from kicking out, twisting this way and sending it back at you. Even though it's between a fence, it has nowhere to go but in a straight line. So I haven't had any kickback since I added these. And they work nice with the unit when uh, it's down too. This one sits right behind it. So it's a real safe procedure having everything together for me. Uh, number 16 is custom feather boards. Uh, these are just a piece of simple steel. I put some grooves in the bottom and put a couple washers in. That's how easily those are made. 
big thick piece of uh, rock maple cut with bandsaw grooves. That's all it is. And these help when you're doing rabbiting or doing dados to a whole bunch of different boards and they have to be true to the fence for your rabbit where it's going to be. So it's just a safety feature. They cannot kick out once you bend this inward to get past it with a piece of wood. They get longer the other way. It can't kick out. So it's another safety feature. Real nice if you're doing dados and stuff with repetitive cuts with lots of pieces. And number 17 is a feather board for the fence. Now if you have a little back hook or a way to get onto an extrusion, it's pretty simple to make these. All it is, is it's clamping down on the profile of your fence. That's it. A couple of bolts are behind here within a slot. And Again, when you're doing something that has to be held against your fence, you want it to be held down to the table, otherwise your dados or your rabbits are going to vary if your wood has a little bit of warp or what have you. So when you're running a whole bunch of pieces through, this is a huge help to be able to do this. And number 18 is making sure that the tabletop is square with the blade. I made this piece of plastic and I made it fit very tightly within that miter joint and I put an indicator on top of here. The stuff was all very inexpensive, and I mean very inexpensive. This isn't a good indicator by any means, but this is good enough for all that I'm doing with it, okay? And you take a test reading way on the side, make a mark, let's say on this corner of the blade, take a test reading over here, slide this thing down, then you move your blade over to this side where your mark is, take a test reading over there again, and then you'll have to loosen up. There's four bolts underneath each corner of the top. And you have to loosen up these bolts and skew the top till it's just right with the blade. And then lock down the four bolts and you're good to go. For number 19, we'll call it dust collection. That's the lower blast gate. I have another one when I have the upper hood down. Right there. Just something simple, keeps the shop cleaner, keeps your air breathable. Number 20, you gotta kinda take my word for. It's basically that you won't have this mess that you'll be standing in when you're trying to push stuff through the saw and you won't have traction to do it because there's a mess in front of the saw. If you have dust collection in your cabinet and you did some of the stuff that I mentioned to tape your cabinet off and fill the spots under the table with foam and such. And even if you go as far as to put an overhead on it like that or something different, there's other ones out in the market if you don't have an eight foot table that'll work. It's a lot nicer to not have that under your feet and feel that you're still being safe and you can still walk. So that's kind of a nice addition. Okay, for 21, we'll talk about how you would make a lot of strips safely and accurately. Now, my way, let's say you wanted to make a strip about as wide as a pencil, okay? Something thin. If you're gonna cut it like this against the fence, you're gonna be cutting away your fence, okay? That's not gonna work so good for you at the end for sure. Okay, so this is my way of cutting real thin pieces and making it work out. What you need to do is just slide your fence over till it feels like it's lightly snug and start cutting your part. That one's gone. Move it over. Again, it's going to be a little shorter. So you're going to move your fence just till it's perfect. A little bit of movement in it. And you're going to cut another, and another, and another, and another, and those will all be within a few thousands, a hair width of each other when you're done, if you followed the correct tension you're starting with each time. You can't make one really tight, and then the next one's real sloppy, otherwise they're going to vary. But this is the best way i found to do this. Now, if you need bigger pieces, you can forget and forgo all this right here. And just take a piece of plastic or a piece of wood and put, two, put some tape on the back side of it. You move your piece over until you find where you need it. You set it down and literally tape it right to the top here. 
and you can do the same game as I'm doing here with just a piece taped down. Can't adjust it once it's down. It's a little more monkeying around, but works very well both ways. Anyway, that's that tip. And here's what one of those looks like out of the table. It's just a bolt. It's all it is with a washer or two washers welded to the head. Number 22 is the tenon maker. Now, for those of you who are new to what a tenon maker is, I threw together a little sample here. I cut a left side, a right side, and I did one up the middle. But what this does is it takes a, a board on end and fastens it in for you. Now, if you say, well, my board's too long or too wide, well, this does adjust. And you can now put the clamp closer to where you need on a bigger piece, okay? Um, this thing will also tilt. Uh, you can adjust it in and out just micro amounts with really nice adjustments. Locks down really well. Um, it's an inexpensive piece because it comes out of China. They do have really good ones if you're interested. But for as few of them as I do, this has worked really uh, pretty good. It's a heavy piece of cast iron. It weighs about 20 pounds. So, you know, 10 kilo, a little, little less. Okay, number 23 is a molder head. And these, I don't know if you can see these due to the tape I have on there. Depending upon the varying depth of how deep you're cutting in, are what these cutters are going to do. And these eight are the ones I have for this unit that goes into a table saw. Number 24, Freud's dial with dado. Read the specs. One mark equals four thousandths of an inch. And you can audibly hear these marks. And it's turning that screw in and out. So you just loosen the arbor on your saw a little bit. If you need ten thousandths, you're going to have to do two clicks, right? And then a half and tighten it. There would be ten thou. How cool is that? And for number 25, under table storage. Yeah, I cheated a little bit. I decided I needed uh, melamine, black melamine, with some walnut at the outside edges of it. would look pretty cool, and I just happened to have sheets of it laying around. Or a partial sheet, I don't remember what it was, so I thought, yeah, let's do that. Um, it was pretty simple. It's not a big deal to do. And then I put some tracks in here to get the doors in. They go in like a standard window pane or anything else would, and... There you go, instant storage that's fairly dust free. 26 is lower cabinet storage. Now I didn't have to do this either, but I thought it would work really nice with the other one. And a little light comes up, instantly locks, you can store whatever you want underneath there. And uh, like that, it works okay, gets the job done. And for number 27, instant access to blades is always good. And at the same time, they're going to be pretty safe in here. This is all sugar pine, so nothing's going to be ruined. Slide it closed. More storage on top for glue bottles, staplers, and whatnot. And for number 28, is actually putting like a 30 degree angle here at the edge of the table. And you can see how that's been done. That's so when you move thick material or thin material through here or warped material through the rolling table, that it doesn't slam into your next edge and it continues on to the next table. For number 29, I will say walnut corners on the rolling table. The rolling table tends to kind of smash into stuff by accident while it's still rolling or as you put stuff up on top of it, I didn't want these corners digging into stuff. So I put 
a radius on them after I made them and they've really taken a beating over the years if you can see at this end this one's broken <laughs> so they definitely did their job and number 30 is just a simple metal plate that goes along with the fence it's just held on with velcro and this is for your uh, magnetic air tools or what have you that need a magnetic surface because everything is die cast aluminum number 31 Blast gates. Some easy to make, some you can buy. The idea is just to make it so that your saw, your router, whatever it is you're using it on, is the most efficient it can be. That's all. Number 32. A fence. Now, standard fence, add a piece of hardwood, a little bit of sandpaper to the front, you are set. Right? but you have a little bit of slop. Sometimes that'll kill you if you're building stuff with a lot of pieces. So they came out with something like this. And this will allow you to break up into half a degree increments on either side. So you can literally break up 180 degrees in half a degree increments repeatedly. And the reason why it works there are eight of these in total, you're seeing two. A split piece of nylon. Tighten up the screw, the nylon gets bigger, it now fits tight in the slot. And because they did that eight times throughout the whole unit, there's where you get your accuracy from. Again, both work very well. Okay, number 33. Do you see the wipe that the board is touching? Oh, it makes that go up and down. That piece is keeping debris from hitting you. So for you guys who are doing composite cuts and aluminum and other non-ferrous sheet stock, that will keep you from having any of those pieces hit you. So if you can make something like that that has a wipe on it like that, it's so safe it's absolutely mind-boggling. I can actually cut as much aluminum as I want now and I don't get hit by one piece. Let me show you another view. Okay, so here you can see how that works. So as the blade's cutting, it's throwing all the debris at the front of the shield and then it goes up. It's being trapped because this is touching the material from hit going underneath it and hitting you. So as long as that protrudes down and past your rollers, it's going to deflect up and in. Just a thin piece of polycarbonate. And for number 34, just a real simple way to make your tables adjustable and level is just using T-nuts up inside a block of wood and then using flathead bolts or carriage screws, which you see in the distance. Either way works good and it's fast, it's easy, and it's cheap to do. And number 35 is real simple. Adding any kind of tables to your table saw will instantly give you a nice glue up bench or a workbench or anything else you need to do after you're done making said item that you made on your table saw. <laughs> Here there's like, uh, I did the math, I think it's 67 square feet of table. But again, I'm a one-man band and I do a lot of plastic cutting. So real thin plastics and stuff. I needed a huge table to do this stuff all myself. So it works out pretty good if you have the room to do it. And for 36, where's the blade wrench? Oh, that's right. It's always here, magnetically attached. <laughs> so that's number 36. It's simple. It's easy. And for number 37, a quick backdrop, and you can use your table saw. Just a bed sheet wrapped around some EMT, which is electrical pipe. A couple bearings I put in each end, and it just spins up. And you just reel it in. And that's it. There goes your bed sheet, gone. So I use that for when I'm done making something. I can take pictures and that's my backdrop. Number 38, push sticks. Now these are just out of masonite, real thin masonite, and I have 
These are for doing obviously really thin pieces, you know, and the only commonality to each one of these is that they all have sandpaper on the bottom of them. And then we have one giant one over here for really big stuff and that's got a removable heel on it. So you can do what you want for thickness back here. I mean, if you're always doing thick stuff to have a, a thicker heel back here is a good idea. But uh, I do a lot of thin stuff, so I can't. And there you go, push sticks, number 38. Number 39, blade stabilizers. Now, you will have to change your throat plate if you decide to use these because it shifts your blade over a little bit. But they work exceptionally well and in that they give you really nice finished cuts. If you have a nice sharp blade and your fence is good and strong, I'd say they're well worth doing. But again, you will have to change your throat plates, so be well advised if you decide to go down this route. Now for number 40, depending upon uh, how bad you do or don't care about your mess in your shop, is sealing up that lower shelf. All the way around I put in some silicone all the way at those bottom corners, all the way around the bottom of the shelf, just to help seal it up. It's one of, those th one of those things you don't have to do, but it just helps it to work even better. For number 41, I actually shaved down the bolt that holds the handle on. You can see that's really thin now. And the reason I did that is this. When I hold on to the fence and I want a little adjustment, I do this to move the fence little by little. And it's not nearly as comfortable when that was a normal bolt. Another thing I've added is an O-ring inside of there to make that a little smoother and not rattle around so much as you use it. For number 42, I laid this throat plate over my zero clearance. And it kind of shows you what you're going to need to do if you're going to go to your throat stabilizers. How you're going to have to have this milled out on the inside. Or to not use it at all anymore. But I need it when I go on 45 degree angles and stuff. So that's something I had to do. Number 43. I added this as a, just a quick way to turn on and off vacuum. So when I move to the next machine, I'll have as strong a su suction as I can possibly have. And it's just a simple cord that it's pulling on, a leather cord and pushing on it to open the blast gate. But just something to think about when you're setting up a shop Number 44, matting. Some just locks together, real quick to do, inexpensive, and it really helps out your back from standing on concrete all day long if you spend a lot of time at the table saw. And for number 45, let's look at this pin. I put a nice angle on this so that when the table comes back, it knocks the pin out. And you get that nice soft stop at the end from that rubber washer. I keep knocking this in when I'm at the saw, leaning against it. Then I pull the table back and it slams into it violently and it's not good. So I put that on there and it works out uh, a little softer now. Number 46. Ultra fine Scotch Brite pads on a cast iron surface. Get it all cleaned up nice till it's smooth. And then using a little of this on any hard surface turns the top into a whole new level of easy. 47. These T slots that are in your table, a lot of them are rough. And that means that when you run a miter fence in there, that it's going to ride along a rough surface. And if these are fairly clean inside and kind of deburred and smooth, you'll notice your cuts will improve and it'll be easier to push your miter fence through the slot. You don't want to get crazy sanding in there though because you are going to make it wider. What you want to be able to do is just smooth it. For number 48, I'm thinking about all the people out there who are going to make one of these. Don't forget a narrow nose attachment too for inside because you're not always going to use, be able to do something this wide 
you're going to want to do narrow stuff too. So just something to think about. And for number 49, start with your saw blade all the way up and then put it at a 45 degree angle. Pop open your service door. Grab a can of dry lube, some kind of aerosol Teflon lubricant. Works really well. And do your tef or do your trunnions up on top. You can see the lubricant dripping down. And hit your different shafts and your worm gears. And give everything a genuine a, a, a good good coating. Turn your different parts a little bit, give it another shot, and your saw will thank you. <laughs> Mine was starting to get kind of cranky and loud. We had to give her another blast. And for number 50, here I have a couple of tools for the anchor fence and for the tenon maker, along with a few pencils. Not all of you can use that because I'm sure you'll have a wing there, but it might be an idea generator for doing something at the other end of the wing. Just something to think about. Number 51, although I do not like to walk across cords, I really didn't have a choice here. I have to get back here. The outlet's there at the wall, obviously. And uh, I decided a cord threshold would be safer than nothing. And it's worked out pretty good. Simply a couple pieces of hardwood taped to the floor. Some 45 degree angles on either side of it so you don't trip over it as bad and break your neck. But the cord is level with a little bit lower than the top, just a hair. So it's better than nothing, I figured. Number 51. Number 52, if you happen to have an attachment on the side of your saw, you might want to consider putting in some blocks of steel. You'll see those thick plates installed there. This one here looks a little beat up, can't miss it. Dead screen, center of screen. I have those on the inside too. So it sandwiches the box itself and makes it much more rigid than it was before so that I can open up a second leaf on here and put much more weight on it without any flex whatsoever. Just a thought. For number 53, way down in the bottom, the silver thing you see is the dust collection port. If you reach your hand in there very carefully, because there's a lot of screws on the inside that are sharp, you might find there's a bunch of pieces of wood and things that are in there blocking and obstructing vacuum. For number 54, I change a lot of blades per day back and forth from plastic to wood and such like that. And I find that it's pretty nice if you deburr the inside edge, the underside of the table here. So as you're pulling your hand in and out with the blade all the times, it just doesn't hack up the back side of your hand. Mine was razor sharp from casting. For number 55, you can actually remove a little bit of the vibration in your saw by if your saw has been sitting for a while, you'll have three belts on the back side, typically, of your pulleys. Now, I don't show them very good in there. But those three belts get a set because it's been stretched apart. So if you take your blade and rotate it just until the set is midway between the two, so now the blade won't go forward and it won't come backwards on its own. It's like hanging in the middle, balanced, if you will. Then you'll find that the set is stretching your blade out or your belts out again. Leave that sit for a short period of time and once you get started again you're going to notice a lot less vibration. Number 56 we'll call a piece of helper stock. This here. If you don't use that and you just cut off a small part, the part falls away and doesn't end up having a perfect 90 degree at its edge because as it's being cut off, there's a little nib that's left over. If you put a piece of helper stock behind, and then run this through, and make sure your piece of helper stock is considerably taller than the part in front of it, otherwise it'll be cut off too. Now when you hold these two together, one over here, let me grab the camera here, goofy, and now one hand over here, you would do those two hands at the same time, or at least I do. As long as I stay an inch away, I'm happy with a real shallow cut like this of 5 16 high. You can now create a small piece here that's cut off perfectly at a 90 with no nib. And that's a dangerous but 
Be very careful, number 56. Number 57, you might consider a can of this dry coat. Pretty expensive product, but it works incredibly well on uh, aluminum, plastic, and it works good for drill bits and uh, Forstner bits and stuff like that. So something else to consider. Number 58 is all about the fence and is the fence square? Is the fence square to the blade? And then how much slop does your fence have between itself and the rail? So as you loosen up your fence to track left or right, how easy is it to move? Does it rack a lot left and right when you go to move it? If you take all the slop out of it, but just the little bit you need to still move things, when you lock down your actual tension, it never moves from where the scale is set. If, however, you have a lot of rack in your fence, you'll notice you move it down to a certain number and when you tighten it, it always moves a little bit. That's just because the fence has too much slop in it. And for this fence, it's you snug these big bolts down and it forces nylon tighter up against the fence and gets nice and snug. So the next one from there that's a good idea is having your fence perfectly 90 degrees to this surface. And once you have that, then having this track properly with the slot. And then your fence is all ready to go. For number 59 is a quick cheat of mine. And it's how do you know that your miter gauge is square? Well, I'll loosen up the adjustment, flip it over in the gauge here, and put it up against the front of the saw and tighten it back down. And that tightens everything up nice and square. Now you gotta check and make sure your saw is the same as mine, that it, yours is, your face is level, but it works great. Number 60. Sometimes your miter gauge goes all the way to the end if you have a table that doesn't have a groove in the back. And to keep that from happening and knocking my gauge out of kilter from slamming it into the end by accident again, 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 sometimes I'll put a real tiny piece of rubber at the very end of that so it does not do that and knock the gauge out. Number 61 is never lose the darn nut again. Put your finger on the end of the spindle. With your thumb, start to just twist, or with your finger, twist this. When you get to the end, spin it onto your fingertip while holding your fingertip tight against that spindle. When you come out, you're going to find that that's literally threaded onto your finger. Every time you go to put it back on, if you literally have it that way, and you bring this in here, you're holding onto it with two fingers. It's threaded onto your finger. If you first push into the center of the spindle, then all you're doing is spinning it on your thumb, and it automatically loads itself right onto the shaft. You'll never drop that ever again. Number 62, we'll call the rolling table leaf lock. Just a piece of wood that I insert, and this keeps it centered so it can't fall out, if you will. That's the lock. And that's that. At this end we have just a stop and then a way to store it. For number 63, I decided to use a Teflon filled acetal for this insert that our fasteners go through. And that way it'll just take a lot of wear, abuse over the years and it'll never have slop in it. For number 64 is the adjustment you can make for a table. This one here is one inch diameter steel with a hole drilled off center and you take a nylon screw from the front and stop it from spinning and there's your adjustment to make your fence true to your blade. And for number 65 is attempt to keep your rollers clean. 
There's two rollers in here, one here and one in the front of the table. They're always opposite the other roller you can see. They're black inside and they have a V. And you'll find that there's probably some crushed dirt that's smashed onto those rollers and it doesn't operate smooth anymore. And if you listen, sometimes you can hear it as you move your table. You can hear how it's going round and round and hitting the thump, the thump, the thump on dirt. And if you clean that off, your table will work a lot nicer. Mine needs to be taken apart because these do have dirt inside, both top rollers. For number 66, if you want those butter smooth cuts, you got to keep the face of the bearing you see dead center in screen. Along with the pipe it rides on, both of those things need to be kept clean. And you can have some amazing cuts if they are. And last but not least, number 67. Fix the fence, pretty simple. Fill it in with epoxy, sand it smooth. You'll never know it's there other than visually.